Thanks, Vanessa. Um, as Vanessa said, I am the chair of Citrus Australia, the national peak industry body for citrus. Um, citrus Australia is a relatively new body. Um, it is a grower-owned company that came about after six years of consultation and debate about a, a better way forward for the structure within our industry. Um, it is a grower-owned company and all of the members pay a voluntary contribution per hectare. Um, our board is a skills-based board made up of a mix of growers and independents from right across our supply chain, from right across all of our growing regions. And given that we are only 0.3% of world production of citrus, um, our industry sees that it is vital that we do and continue to consolidate our structures and ensure that we get a much more efficient and effective use of all of the resources that we have to try and make a more sustainable industry. The citrus industry, whilst being the largest fresh produce exporter of, export of Australia, is not without its issues for growers and the wider industry. Over the past years, growers have faced declining returns to the point where many returns are in fact less than the cost of production. This picture has become far too regular a sight in the southern regions over the last seasons. Why? Some of the problems are that large volumes of mid-season navels have been stored due to a decrease in demand and an increase in supply. So if they are being stored longer, it means that there is a decrease in the optimal quality of the product. And ultimately, that means that the best produce is not making it to the supermarket and ultimately to the consumer. Other issues, the average spend on fruit and vegetables by Australians continues to decline, and citrus is no exception. We face extreme competition not just from apples and pears, not so much nuts, but chips, Mars bars, anything that the supermarket will put at the point of sale. And hence, it is no surprise that Australia has now taken over from the US on an obese per capita rate. You know, who would have ever thought that you know, everything's big in America, that we are now bigger than they are? But as returns have continued to decline, the overall loser is our rural and regional communities. Growers continue to leave our industry and to leave those communities. The flow on for that is that it is a sad story that those communities are now losing services, families. The schools are dwindling, sporting clubs. You know, what then when all of these rural communities cease to exist? You know, will we all have to move to the high rises in the cities? For the past 20 years, the US has been the major focus of our industry, high export volumes and fantastic returns back to growers in the industry. We see here in 2010 where Chile entered the US. Chile has a much lower, a much lower cost of production than we do and it also has a much shorter shipping time. And unfortunately, at the same time, our dollar started to climb and climb. You know, we currently export to around 32 different destinations around the world. Japan has now taken over as our highest market by volume. Many people often come up to me and say, why do you go on about the exchange rate so much? Surely 10 or 20 cents cannot make that much difference to your returns. These columns show you know, the difference that a mere 6 cents can make, let alone a devastating 20 cents. These figures are all based on a $23 sale. And it is worth pointing that a $23 sale in the US market is a really good sale, but that is for premium class one fruit. And unfortunately, there will be a number of other um, sizes that will only get $18 sale in the US, which hence means the net return will actually be less than the cost of production. Adding to the pain for our growers is the rising costs government policies in relation to wages, OH&S, tax, along with freight increases, fertiliser, all of the input charges, but the returns to growers are diminishing all the time, not only from our export due to the high exchange rate, but also on the domestic front. 
The cost of getting into new markets is substantial for growers. For instance, the protocols into Korea, China and Thailand are so significant that it means you know, many more hours of work on the farm for the growers at extra cost. You know, for instance, on my property, we have a focus on China, and it means that we have to have you know, extreme high skirts, and we actually have to spray the butt of each and every tree with a chemical. You know, getting someone to go around and spray the butt of 40,000 trees is a long, costly process. So we need to ensure that we've got the returns to match the input. As state governments are reducing funding into fruit fly prevention and research, the added cost of this is all falling back onto our industry, onto our growers. We have a saying in our industry, the tree pays for everything. Unfortunately, at this point in time, citrus growers' trees are really sagging under the added burden of all of these extra costs. As consumer preferences change, our growers are responding to this. The current trend towards easy peelers seems to be taking off worldwide. For growers to switch variety, it's not just a matter of, you know, like a wheat crop or whatever, after it's harvested, you just go and put something else in. Whether they graft or whether they replant, it means they will have no cash flow for around five years off that particular patch. So it's a huge investment, and if everybody around the world plants exactly what you decide to plant that year, you may end up in exactly the same boat that you started in. When the carbon tax was brought in, we were told agriculture slash horticulture, very minimal effect will happen. You won't see a huge rise in costs. And you're right, on the first day, we didn't see it. But as we start to go through, so looking at, this is my electricity account, looking at this, you can see that it's very quickly headed to a 25% increase in my costs. And that is just my electricity account for one month. That doesn't include all of the fuel fertiliser because I get phone calls constantly, sorry Tanya, we're going to put your freight bill up due to the carbon tax. And this is what growers all across the country are facing. And it's not just you know, restricted to citrus, it's all of our farmers across all of our commodities. To add to the pain, every region is also experiencing some level of natural disaster. Jolyon spoke about in his industry what the floods have done in Queensland. And in the southern regions, I've had five mil of rain in six months. So, you know, we, we really do have total opposite ends of the spectrum on a, across our country. Cost to some of the growers in the northern regions from the um, effects of Australia Day and the subsequent rains um, vary, obviously, from grower to grower and region to region, but one of my growers is facing like, a $2 million bill with no insurance just to replace his irrigation infrastructure that has ended up 60 kilometres away. But how does he start that when he no longer has a river, ba river bank to put his pumps on? So these are all of the things that growers are constantly working through, but it is amazing how positive they are staying. You know, true to our heritage, Aussie farmers are the most resilient people in the world, and we are seeing that more and more with the issues that we're currently facing. We are fighting back. We are continually researching new varieties and switching our production base to align with that demand from consumers. We are working on meeting all of those stringent protocols into the new markets, and we're trying to minimise our costs along the whole supply chain, shorten it wherever possible. We have um, instigated national voluntary quality um, maturity standards so that every time we put a piece of fruit on a supermarket shelf that the consumer gets the best possible eating experience that we can give them. And we're also working extremely hard to protect our industry from the constant threats that we face. It is no secret in agriculture we are losing our family farms. The corporate farms are getting bigger. Some may say, you know, what's the issue with that? Generally, your larger corporate farms will give you, you know, greater economies of scales, greater efficiencies. But the downside of it is, as we lose those family farms, there are less people living in our rural communities. Then we have the flow-on effect where we do lose services. We do lose our youth out of our rural communities. Government in every state has been pushing how we need to expand our regional centres, our regional communities. 
How do we do that if the trend of horticulture and agriculture continues on the path it's on? As I said before, does that mean we all go to the city where we've you know, already got overcrowding in schools, overcrowding in hospitals? And um, I'm not too sure about you, but if our agriculture and horticultural sector continues to shrink, you know, does that mean that we do become a net importer of food? And um, I quite like the taste of fresh, clean, green Australian produce, and I'm not too sure that we'd get it from you know, enough countries around the world to feed us. This graph shows that our plantings have actually remained quite um, consistent over the times, um, which to me is a testament to the strength of our growers because they continue to invest. You know, even over the last three years where their returns have continued to drop off, they have continued to replant and to, to ensure that their farms remain as viable as possible. In here we can see the low levels that come in at the start of the season. And in this time um, is where um, we still have um, imported citrus available and it's also in every market that we ship to around the world. The US citrus industry has been taking some of our practices into later navels so that they are now in our markets later and later. So what we need to do is start to capitalise at the end of our season, which is a peak window for us when we don't face as much competition from the likes of Chile, Peru and obviously the US is well and truly gone. But our biggest focus always has to be on export. We grow in Australia too much citrus for domestic consumption. So we need to continue that we focus on that. Last year, we exported the highest number of cartons since 2001. So even though we're fighting that high Aussie dollar, um, we are still pushing the export there. A number of reasons. Yes, it is tough on the growers, but if we remove ourselves from those markets, we will lose them. It is as simple as that. Chile, Peru, South Africa, they're all sitting there waiting to be able to take all of our markets from us. So it is vital that we continue to do this. You'll see here 2010. Um, some of this has to do with citrus being slightly biannual in its cropping nature, but also our high Aussie dollar also has a lot to do with some of these fluctuations. We are constantly sourcing new markets, especially those that have a short transit time and where there is a growing population. China is a key region for us, not only due to its increasing population, but the fact that it now has a much larger proportion of its population in the middle class sector, so that we have more and more people able to afford to buy quality produce and really doing a focus on that for their families. But there is much work to be done. The protocols into these markets are so stringent that it is not affordable for all of our growers to send to these markets. You know, in fact, in a lot of our work, um, the citrus industry has been pioneers in this. When we do um, cold sterilisation, um, the stone fruit industry would not have ever looked at it had, not, had we not proved to our markets overseas that this was the right way to go forward, that it would work and it would be acceptable in those. Some of the new markets have particular varieties that they like. The Asian markets love red fleshed oranges, especially when it has that real red blush on it. So they're varieties that we need to continuously work on. Some of our varieties are um, bred, for want of a better word, here in Australia. Others are sourced overseas, and then we bring them in to evaluate how they will grow. But the biggest thing that we have to watch in all of that is that we're not bringing in any new pests and disease. We have to be so vigilant and ensuring that it co everything comes through the right process, um, through the quarantine, and um, we, ended up, we end up with clean, green um, trees. The mandarin, taking the world by storm, is the Afura mandarin. Very easy to peel, seedless, tastes absolutely fantastic. There are huge volumes of this variety being planted in every citrus growing country of the world, including Australia. 
So one of the things that we have to be really mindful of as an industry is that this doesn't just end up becoming another commodity. The way this is marketed to the consumer is going to be all important in ensuring that the growers that have invested the time and the money into these varieties don't end up exactly where we are now. We have new citrus, re citrus growing regions, Moree and Gunnedah. These regions are focused on orange specifically for juice um, to ensure that we will have premium, fresh juice available for consumers all year round. You know, the, um, that particular region in full production with current plantings in the next two years will bring in about 30,000 tonnes of oranges. So the biggest issue that the juicing guys face is that the consumer goes into the supermarket and there's 15 different cartons of orange juice. Some are fresh premium, others are a mix of local and imported. Um, normally, the mix is the water from Australia. So we really need to focus on having less of the um, concentrate bought into our country, um, but at the same time, ensuring that the labels on each and every carton allow the consumer to pick it up and go, right, I know exactly where that came from. I want to support my Australian farmers, so I don't want to go near that. So really getting the government to focus on truth in labelling is going to be a big issue for our industry as we go forward. The other downside, I suppose, is that there's been a lot of um, talk out there about um, juice being bad for children. They shouldn't be eating it, it takes the enamel off their teeth, there's too much sugar in it. But in fact, um, if you go to the dentist, the doctors, whatever, they will tell you drinking juice at breakfast time is fine for the children. It's the poppers that are filled with sugar that people are giving them after school, putting them in their lunchbox. So that's how we have to really make all of our consumers out there aware of what it is they are getting out of the carton on the shelf. As we identify um, and evaluate new varieties, we have to ensure that we are filling the gaps in our current supply period. I spoke before about you know, having um, a large volume in here in the mid-season and down here we really need to focus on the lates. Um, we don't want to develop varieties where we already have a peak in supply. Um, we're currently working with growers to capitalise on these opportunities that we have. The Australian citrus industry, through Citrus Australia, as I said, has developed the um, quality standards and we're also working really hard at removing that early harvested fruit that doesn't taste as good as it should. We've also invested and continue to invest in post-harvest techniques to ensure that when the consumer does get a piece of fruit, it still has that just-picked citrus, sweet, juicy taste because that's what we need to do, really focus on our consumers. Last year we conducted 238 tests off supermarket shelves and it's fantastic that we had 100% compliance with our MRLs. Biosecurity is one of the biggest threats our industries face. If we look back at the canker ep episode in Emerald, um, it was at a direct cost of $30 million. That doesn't include what the grower lost and the fact that he had no trees in production for five years. But seriously, Canker is a baby when we look at diseases such as citrus greening or Huan Long Bing. And the reality is that these threats can come to us any day, not just via, um, you know, through um, airports or whatever else, but a lot of them can actually come in on the winds. Foreign investment, a hot topic, the debate for and against rages. Now, it's not necessarily detrimental to our industry. Two of our largest players are now majority owned by foreign investment. But we need to capitalise on how we do that. And one of the things that we really do need to ensure is that it is managed, both in the number of hectares that we allow them and also to ensure that the land is managed as efficiently and effectively as our Australian growers do it. Because you know, the Australian growers are known to care for the land, the environment. So we have to ensure that whoever we allow in here, um, we do it in the right way. Wrapping up. Our growers are fiercely independent. They are doing it tough, as are many other commodity groups. We're not looking for handouts. We're actually looking to work closely with governments to obtain some good outcomes for our industry. Citrus Australia has recently employed a full-time market access manager to try to work through some of those market access issues. 
We need DAF to come on board with us and work with us to try and get these through. You know, as Jolyon said, it's a long process to get anything happening. And, you know, for some of our growers, it may be too late. Last year, the US negotiated their trade agreement with Korea. Theirs is far better than ours is, and they just had the best season ever exporting to Korea. As I said, biosecurity, the unseen threat. We need to keep it at the forefront of our minds. Are we prepared? Unfortunately, I don't think so. Water security, security. It is really hard to get growers to continuously invest in capital replantings um, when there are so many unknowns. Not just the policies and the wage rates and the weather and everything else, but water is crucial to all of them. And I think the thing that seems to have been forgotten is that farmers everywhere are the most efficient, effective users of water. They want a healthy river system. Without it, they can't farm. It's very simple. But we are investing in land, in water, um, as well as millions of dollars in world-class technology. This particular packing shed um, will be up and running this year. It's at a cost of over $10 million to that particular grower. So that's the level of investment, the level that um, our growers really are putting in to our industry. As I said, our industry is constantly researching new and improved methods, varieties and markets. We're constantly striving for new and innovative ways of doing things that will improve our product and reduce the costs along the chain. That is why it's so important for us to have the match funding from government to work on these areas so that we can continue to grow you amazing fresh quality produce. We can continue to be major employers across regions and a major contributor to our economy as a whole in a meaningful way. And above all, so that our rural and regional communities will still be there in the future, built by our farmers who are the backbone of this country for all of our children and their children. Thank you.